Good morning. I'm Erin, and I'm so glad that you're joining us today. If you are new to the village or are wanting to connect with us further, please take a minute to fill out our Connect card. It asks for just a little bit of information so that we can get to know you better. Throughout the Bible, mountaintops are used to demonstrate God's power, to speak to His people, and to transform the world. This summer, we are looking at some of those moments in our sermon series, Mountaintop Moments. Today, Pastor Allison will be sharing about Mount Carmel and the story of Elijah. As we move into worship, I invite you to join me in just taking a moment to pause, put aside distractions, and focus on God and what He has to say to us today. Let us pray. Thank you, God, so much for bringing us here this morning and to hear your word. We are so grateful for this time in this space to open our minds and our hearts to you. We pray that you speak to us through Pastor Allison. Help us put ourselves in the path of your love and grace. In your precious name, amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, or oh, you are my portion, and you are my hiding place. Oh, I believe you are the way the truth, the life, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe through every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take. That you are provider, and you are protector, and you are the one I love. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way. The truth, the life, I believe you are. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today. Mercies that are new, all my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that are new, all my fears and doubts. They can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth. set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth I 
This is week three of a series that we're calling Mountaintop Moments. This summer, we are looking at several specific mountains in the Old and New Testament where God meets people and speaks to people. We gather here for worship on Sundays with the same hope and the same expectation. So as we're traveling to these different mountains in the Bible, we're praying for the same thing, that God would meet us here and speak to us here and do something in our lives while we gather here. We've been saying this summer that if you want God to meet you somewhere, you need to do these three things. First of all, you have to be present. God can't meet you somewhere that you're not. Secondly, you have to be open. You have to be open to the fact that God wants to meet with you here. You can be present and still be completely closed off to receiving anything from God or hearing anything from God. Thirdly, beyond being open, you need to be expectant. Don't just be open to the fact that God might meet you here or speak to you here, but come in expecting that that's what's going to happen. So be present, be open, and be expectant. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time to be here together, God. I pray that you meet us in this place, that we may be open to your word. May you speak in spite of me. May we hear what it is that you want us to hear today. Amen. Turn to your Bible or your Bible app to 1 Kings 18. That's where we're going to be spending our time today. But before we go there, here's the question for today. What do you do when you find yourself in an impossible situation? Who do you turn to when you feel like you're in an impossible situation? Today, we're going to get to see what happened with the Israelites, when they're facing an impossible situation. So first, let me give you a little bit of a backstory of what's happening prior to our story and a little bit about some of the main characters in our story. First Kings is basically about the passing of the role of king from David to Solomon, and then really the downfall of all the kings that follow. David, who was for sure not perfect and messed up a lot, always held his faith and allegiance in God. Solomon started out this way, taking charge, building the temple, and David even gave a blessing in 1 Kings 2.2. Be strong and courageous and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commands, his ordinance, his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses. King Solomon did okay for a while, then lost his way, and then everything from there goes south. One king after the other no longer follows God's command, the worst being King Ahab, who is the king in our story today. King Ahab, as it says in 1 Kings 16.30, Ahab was the son of Omari. He did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who came before him. And Ahab marries a woman named Jezebel, who was the daughter of Nebat, who worshipped Baal and Ahab, erected an altar for Baal. Jezebel also began killing prophets of God during their reign. And in 1 Kings 16, it says that Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, of the God of Israel, than any of the kings before them. And so at this time, God sends the prophet Elijah, who predicts there'll be a drought. Drought on that day is seen as a universal curse. So when God is displeased, rain is withheld. And this is where we pick up in our story. Israel has been in a drought for three years. So in King, 1 Kings 18, God came to Elijah and told him to go and be pres- and present himself to Ahab to let him know that God was going to end this drought and God is going to use Elijah to draw a line in the sand to essentially say this, choose this day whom you will serve as your God, the one true God, or the idols of the land. If you choose the idols, that is your decision. This is not going to end the way that you're hoping it's going to go. But if you choose me, you have to put the idols down. 
So we look in 1 Kings 18. This is basically the beginning of what of a showdown between Elijah and the evil king Ahab. In verse 17, it says, When Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now, Elijah's name actually means the Lord is my God, which really sums up his job as a prophet. His whole ministry is for the purpose of reminding people that the Lord, the God, Israel, is the one true God, but the people turn to other gods. What Ahab is saying is everything was going fine until you showed up. Have you ever noticed how much of a troubler the Holy Spirit is? You just go along fine in your life, and suddenly the Holy Spirit shows up and begins to make trouble about what you've done or what you've said. Or somebody that you love and trust shares something with you that's hard to hear because you know it's true. It's been said that God, of God that the Spirit of God comforts the afflicted but afflicts the comfortable. Now, if we look in verse 18, it says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have, and you abandoned the Lord's commands and had followed the other, other Baals. Baal was not just one God. Baal was a variety of gods, and there was a God for everything. So Elijah is saying, the problem, Ahab, is that when times got tough, when it didn't rain, you didn't turn to the one true God, you turn to the little g-gods of this world. And the Israelite people have done this too. They've tried to, to have their cake and eat it too when it comes to their worship of the one true God. And they've grafted in a bunch of beliefs and other things and other gods with their belief of the one true God. So they've kind of said to God, thank you for bringing us out of Egypt, but now we have some other needs. We need babies, so we're going to turn to the God of fertility. We need crops, so we're going to turn to the other bales to make it rain. We need security, so we're going to turn to the God of victory. C.S. Lewis says that we have what's called generational snobbery, where, where we find it easy to look down on other generations of people and think, how could you do something like this, turning to other gods? But here's the question for us. What do we do when God doesn't do what we want him to do? What do you do when you're praying for rain, but it's not raining? Do you turn to money for security? Do you turn to a bottle? Do you turn to somebody that you're not married to in order to get the affirmation that you're not getting at home? Do you turn to Facebook or Instagram to find somebody to like you? Debbie Martin says, the problem with this kind of approach in life is that you can't turn away from the source and the prince of peace in your life and also find peace in your life. The question for true worshipers of God in this moment is, is God enough for you even in the drought? In verse 19, it says, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on the Mount of Carmel. So the Mount of Carmel was like an epicenter of pagan worship. Any faithful person would have heard this and would have thought Elijah was giving up home-filled advantage. It was like Elijah was summoning all the people to the stadium of their arch rival. And bring forth 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah and who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, the way you would worship false, a false god in this day in that time is you would cook a sacrifice to your God and then whatever your God didn't eat, you got to eat. So in verse 20, it says, so Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on the Mount of Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Underline that question in your Bible. Some translations say, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? So Elijah goes to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and he says, bring your 800 prophets, and we're going to have a showdown. So Elijah is drawing a line in the sand. He's gathering the prophets of Baal, of Asherah, and he's saying, if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, or Asherah is God, follow them. 
but don't keep going back and forth between the two. Like you can just do whatever you want to do. And then the people just said nothing. Now, these aren't anti-God people. These are God's children. In our current context, this would look very much like church people. Those who would be the people who come to our church, in every church, and are trying to live with one foot in the God camp and one foot in the world camp. And God is saying, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. A lot of people are trying to treat Jesus like a buffet. Our life is like a plate. We walk through the buffet and we say, salvation, yes, I'd like to take some of that, please. Forgiveness, I'll take a double helping. My body, no, I'll figure that out on my own. Money, I'm good. Connection and community, oh yes, please give me some of that. Decisions, I can do that on my own. Sacrifice, I don't think I'm going to take that one today. Patience, definitely not today. And Elijah is saying to the people in this moment, God is either the Lord of all or God is not Lord at all. Stop wavering between two opinions. And what Elijah is saying is if you're serving an idol, just serve it and stop pretending like you're not. If money is your idol, just name it. Just tell your family that money is the most important thing to you and that you'll spend time with them when it's convenient for you. But if it gets in the way of you earning more money, you're going to choose money. If romance is your idol, just go for it. Just name it and go all in on it and do whatever you want to do and use whoever you want to use because your own romantic fulfillment is what's most important to you. If approval is your God, then selfie it up. Put every filter on that picture and do whatever it takes for people to click love on your post. Whatever your idol is, serve that idol wholeheartedly. But if Christ is God, serve him with everything you have. C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity has this great quote we've probably heard before. It's a famous quote about this exact topic about people who are trying to be halfway in their belief in Jesus, but don't want to go, half, go all in on him. It says, I'm, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing about, that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said those sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else would be the dev devil of hell. You make your choice. Either this man is and was the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a, for a fool. You can spit him and you can kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Back in verse 22, Elijah says to them, I am the only one of Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let ba Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I'll prepare another bull and put, the wood on, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you will call on the name of God, and I, of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers the fire is the one and true God. And then all the people say, what you say is good. Baal was in charge of the thunderstorms. Baal was in charge of lightning. They were on Baal's home field. The prophets of Baal thought this was a perfect for them. They thought they were going to win. And then Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls, prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call in the name of your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning to noon. And Baal answered, uh, answers, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them, began to talk smack to them. 
He said to them, shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and he must be awakened. Where's your God? Maybe he's deep in thought. The Hebrew here is actually, maybe he's in the bathroom. Elijah is straight up talking trash here. Why was there no response? Because they were calling out to someone who wasn't real and who had no power. It did not matter how hard they tried or how many times they called out to Baal or what words they said or what dance they did because Baal did not have the power to answer them or to rescue them or do anything to respond to them. A few years back, someone wrote a book entitled, titled, We Become What We Worship. And the thesis of this book is what people revere, they resemble. If you worship something made of nothing, you become on the inside something made up of nothing. When things are not going your way, do you turn to the one true God or do you turn to the idols of this world? Do you turn to money for satisfaction and security? Do you turn to your own self for your own self-worth? Do you turn to TV or social media to escape and mask the hurt you're experiencing? Idols lead us on a dead road to depression and loneliness and emptiness because they are a dead-end road with no response when we really need to hear from them. So in verse 28, it says, So they shouted loud and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. And midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one ever answered, and no one paid attention. The idol that let them down, like idols always do, And so they thought they needed to try harder and cry out more and figure out how to make it happen on their own. But it still didn't change their reality in the moment. Here's evidence of an idol. Here's evidence of a false god. It will always require more effort, more dancing, and it will tear you down instead of building you up. Idols always require a sacrifice. You will cut yourself to serve your idol. You will cut your time with your family or the relationships that mean most to you in order to earn more money. You you will cut your morality so that you can take that next step up the ladder. This is what idols ask for. You can give yourself to an idol and give yourself to an idol and give yourself to an idol, and it will never be enough. You have to keep shouting and keep performing and keep dancing and keep cutting, and it will never be enough. The one true God never looks at us and says, dance harder, perform harder, try harder, cut yourself. In fact, the one true God sent his one and only son into the world on our behalf. And that whoever believes in him, God dances over with them with joy. The one true God does not require us to do endless dancing for his approval. Tim Keller says that that Jesus is the only God that if you find him, he will satisfy you and you will fail him. And if you fail him, he will forgive you. And now we turn to Elijah in verse 30. It says, then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones, one for, from each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two measures of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. And 34, it says, do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. What is happening in, so what is happening in regards to the water in this time? It's a drought. Elijah takes their most precious resource and he pours it out and creates for himself what looks to like an, to everyone an impossible situation. Many of us know what it's like to be standing in an impossible situation. 
Some of us feel like we're in an impossible situation in our marriage. Some of us have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. Some of us find ourselves in an impossible financial situation. Some of us are facing a health issue or an addiction or a mental health struggle, and it feels like an impossible situation. What do you do when you find yourself in what feels like an impossible situation? So we look in verse 36. It says, At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you're turning their hearts back again. What if you added that line to the end of your prayers? Lord, heal my marriage so that people will know that you, Lord, are God. Lord, help me in my finances so that people will know that you, Lord, are God. Lord, answer me and heal me so that people may know that you are God. In verse 38, it says, And the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the trent, the water in the trench. And this isn't just a little fire that comes down to slow roast the bull at 225 for 24 hours. This is so much fire that comes down that it even burns the dirt and licks up the water. The Apostle Paul says this about God and about what God does in Ephesians, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we, we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is within work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God does exceedingly more than we could ever imagine. God is the kind of God who does immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. So in verse 39, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And they saw the power of God put on full display. And the only appropriate response in that moment was to worship him. Franz Rochelle was a French tailor and an inventor who in the early 1900s was fixated on inventing a wearable parachute suit. He did some initial experiments from the fifth floor of his apartment building using dummies wearing the suit. One of the tests had been mildly successful, but there had been a lot of failed tests afterwards. So he decided the problem with the test was that it wasn't being done from high enough. So in 1912, he got a permit to conduct a test from the first platform of the Eiffel Tower, about 200 feet off of the ground. However, when he got there, he insisted that he wasn't going to use a test dummy. He was going to wear the suit and test it by jumping off. He was going to be the dummy. There's newsreel footage about this event. Franz is wearing the suit. He climbs up to the rail of the platform. His friends and those around him troubled him and made repeated attempts to try to talk him out of it. But he put his faith in his own ability and his own design. He put full trust in the suit that he developed. So he climbed up on the rail of the platform wearing this beautifully designed parachute suit and he jumped and he fell straight down to his death. What do you do when you find yourself in an impossible situation? This is a metaphor for what happens with the idols in our lives. When you find yourself in an impossible situation, you can have an enormous amount of faith in the temporary idols of this world. You can be enamored by the beauty of their design. You can trust them with your whole life, and you will die. We live in a restless world. We're searching and wavering from one thing to another. St. Augustine wrote in one of his confessions, You have made us for yourself, O Lord. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. I find myself so restless so many nights. I can't sleep, I'm tossing and I'm turning. 
And maybe it's because I'm trying to put my trust in something or someone who can't actually give me the rest and peace that my soul needs. We are searching to be filled and be fulfilled. And we use all the other things but God to fill this longing we have in our soul. When in fact, that restlessness and that longing we are searching for is God. Can we name it rather than saying it's something else? Augustines actually do this. When in an impossible situation, when they feel restless, they name it and they recognize the restlessness they are experiencing is in their situation is moving them into a deeper search for God. So lay down your idols. Call out to the one true God. Lay out before God what it is that you really need. You can trust the God who promises to provide. We're going to enter into a time of prayer and response. I want to encourage you to call out to God. Are you facing an impossible situation? Are you facing difficulty? Are you facing down something and you don't know how it's going to turn out? Bring it to God. And as you pray, pray, God, make a way so these people will know that you are Lord and you are God. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. We are so thankful for the ways that your Holy Spirit moves in and around us. God, some of us are facing that impossible situation today. Some of us are sitting here going, I don't know what to do. I've tried everything else and it's not working. God, allow us to be humble enough to get out of your way, to trust that you can do the impossible, trust that you will provide. God, let us let go of the idols that are dragging us down, that are keeping us from you. Let us no longer put our trust in them, but to put our trust solely in you. Thank you for your son, Jesus God, who can do immeasurably more than we can even ask or imagine. It's in his name we pray. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, while she's all. chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. I fell for He canceled my death.
criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Again, if you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. Please take a minute to fill out our connect card so that we can get to know you a little bit better. If you want to support the ministries of the village by partnering with us financially, you can do so through text or online giving. All the details can be found on our webpage, thevillagenashville.com give. Through your generosity, the Village is able to serve our congregation and community through programs like Camp Village Kids. This week, over 100 kids and volunteers will take over our building to learn about Jesus' love for them and how they can share that with others. If you are local and it's not too late to register your kids for this fun week, scan the QR code or head to thevillagenashville.com kids for more information. We hope to see you again next Sunday, right here online at 9 a.m or in person at 9 and 10.30. As you head into your week, I hope that you will be reminded of Elijah and the promises that God delivered on Mount Carmel. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your abundant, abounding grace. Help us to be more like Elijah and gain loyal obedience to God our Father. I pray that we would draw near to you no matter what we are going through. Your word promises that you will give us gracious help in our time of need. Help us believe that today. Be with our community and our congregation this week. Amen.